This is heat straightening of a, of a damaged bottom flange by Tim Booty of New Hampshire DOT. He's currently the senior engineer in the Bridge Bureau of Bridge Maintenance, and he's a registered professional engineer in the state of New Hampshire. So the idea of using heat and forces to straighten steel has been around for decades. Um, it's been used to um, repair distortions caused by welding, install camber in new beams, and to induce uh, horizontal curvature in bridge girders. This is typically done in a uh, shop setting to undamaged steel. The photo you see is a girder that we purchased for a deck superstructure replacement. We ordered that steel from our vendor and we requested a certain camber to it. And then we went in and uh, welded shear studs, uh, shear connectors, pardon me, and then clips for our diaphragms. That induced what we refer to in engineering circles as a whoop in the girder, and we actually used some heat straightening techniques to try to straighten that out prior to setting that in place. Heat straightening is a repair technique that's connected in the field to steel that has been damaged and portions of the steel have exceeded the yield stress. This relies on controlling the maximum temperature that's applied, controlling the external extraints applied to those girders or that steel member, and only working in the plastically deformed zones through a, a series of heating and cooling cycles. The steel, when we're working on with the temperature is not progressive uh, beyond dull red, and the restraining force is calculated based on the section of the steel. So heat straining isn't taking a torch and heating up the things cherry red and just pushing the thing over with as much force as you can. It's a very uh, calculated, nuanced process. We use this Federal Highway Report from 1999, uh, heat straining damages, uh, repairs of damaged steel structures. That manual is largely based on an by research from the Louisiana State University, sponsored by the Louisiana Department of Transportation. From that research, they determined that heat straining can be used to effectively repair damaged steel, providing science behind the art performed by practitioners for years. They determined that the mechanical properties of steel are unimpaired under proper quality control, and that jacking and restraining forces can be used to, if controlled, to uh, make the heat straining process more efficient. They also determined that heat training should be limited to two similar repairs on the same location, so that you can't go back multiple times if something keeps getting struck. So when we do heat training repairs, we have to control certain things. We have to control the temperature that's applied, and we do that through uh, specifying the size of the torch. We use single uh, orifice tips on our uh, oxycelline torches, and we use we have the practitioners, our bridge maintainers, track the speed that they run those torches over the the steel, to control the amount of heat that's being put into the steel. We use temperature guns and temperature crayons for checking the actual temperature that's being applied to the steel. And we use specific heating patterns as outlined in the FHWA manual to induce the movement that we're looking for in those steel members. We have to control the restraining force that's used. Um, some places it's called the jacking force. And we take a look at each section that we're trying to move, the sectional properties, and we calculate a load to produce that force and apply that to the rams that we're using. So we come up with a uh, PSI on a gauge that we're looking at to meet when we're in the field doing this work. And then we use a series of string lines, straight edges, et cetera, to try to determine the extent of the actual plastic damaged area, and we work just those areas. Some of the things that we have to look at, some project considerations include, a lot depends on the location of the damage and what the access to that damage is, uh, what the traffic volumes are, the extent of the impact, et cetera. We have to take a look at how we're going to affect repairs, we'll look, at, look at our worker access and safety. Uh, we're dealing a lot of times with uh, lead-based primers, so we're having to do paint removal. We're working off of man lifts, so that involves uh, our fall protection guidelines. We have to look at respiratory protection and the fact that we also have workers working with open torches next to each other. So in the case of uh, one thing, sometimes we have to take a look at um, when we can have lane closures based on traffic volume, school bus schedules, and we, have, we review all phases of the work with the crew prior to doing the work. And we'll actually do some practice on the ground where we'll actually uh, have the guys fire up some torches, we'll actually uh, put some heat into some steel and talk about the methods behind how they do it and then have them practice uh, working around each other with those torches. The first of two case studies that we're gonna look at, this one is in Dover. It's a Spalding Turnpike, it's over Long Hill Road. It's a three-span continuous IBC, it's built in 1956. It does have a clearance of 13 foot and nine inches. The accident occurred on February 6th 
We were notified of the accident February 19th. Um, someone from the Dover, New Hampshire DPW drove under the bridge and said, you know, that doesn't look right. I should tell somebody. And so they notified our Bureau of Turnpikes. And uh, so I got a phone call. I was a little north of here, and I met the superintendent at the bridge in about half an hour. And we were just amazed that it had been a couple weeks since it had been noticed. Apparently, a, uh, someone was hauling a piece of logging equipment. And they went to go underneath the bridge. They struck the bridge. So they backed up. They unloaded the logging equipment. They drove the logging equipment under the bridge. They hooked back up to the trailer, drove the trailer under, reloaded the logging equipment on the other side, and took off. And nobody called to say, hey, something happened. Ends up, when we were talking to the neighbors around, we're like, what happened? And they said, well, I don't know. There's a traffic backup. We didn't think much of it. Come to find out, a Stratford County Sheriff had stopped on site and had written down enough information that we were able to have Dover PD track down the driver of the vehicle and he was actually charged with a felony for leaving the scene of the accident. So the damage, as you can see here, is to uh, girder 14. This is the exterior girder and span number two of the three-span structure. The lower flange was displaced approximately 18 inches and the lower flange had also rotated and we can see the uh, puncture to the web from the diaphragm. That day, we immediately uh, closed off the shoulder of the area based on the configuration of the spawn turn like above. We were able to keep the shoulder closed and not affect any of the travel lanes. Uh, we did end up having to clear all the snow off because it's February and we had some snow load on there. It's just another look at the damage on there. When I was looking at the damage with our superintendent, we were already planning out, okay, we're gonna cut this girder off and we're going to support the bridge and we're going to buy a new girder and we're going to roll this thing in and we're going to splice it together and we're trying to kind of figure this things out. And my administrator at the time got talking and looking at it and his name is Doug Gosson. He had been to a heat straightening class in New Jersey and the more he looked at it, he says, you know what, we can heat straighten this. And my superintendent and I kind of looked at each other and he said, really? Um, you think we can? And he said, well, I think we can and you're going to. So we uh, learned on the fly a little bit under his toolage about how to uh, get this thing straightened back. We were able to perform the paint removal, the, the lead-based paint, using lane closures with uh, temporary lights due to the fact there's a low volume local road. When we were actually doing the work, we closed the road down. We'd wait till the school bus went through for the elementary school, and then we'd close the road down, and then we'd open it back up before the high school bus came through in the afternoon. So we, get, we had a nice, we had a road closure, so we had some space to work, but we had time constraints as well. This girder is not composite with the deck, so I, I likened it to like a piece of cooked spaghetti. The more you pushed on it, pulled on it, did other things, the whole thing would just move around, which wasn't most conducive to our work here. So this picture shows some of the uh, jacking setups that we had. Our main effort was this horizontal jacking because we wanted to get the rotation back out of the web and make the flange back under the web. And so you see we have some uh, boards set up holding our jacking apparatus here. We braced the adjacent bay as we were pushing against this girder here. Uh, there were times that we were applying a vertical force to the bottom flange because we're trying to get that bottom flange to rotate back up. And where this is not composite, we actually had the girder pull away from the bottom of the deck a little bit as well. And we we're trying to get a little bit of camber back up into it to try to get the girder to match the bottom of the deck. Here's just another shot of that jack in there. And it's also, you can see in here, these are our V-heats. This is one of the controlled patterns that we use when we heat straighten, called V-heats. It's uh, applied to, by two bridge maintainers using torches. The idea is you need to get the section of steel at constant temperature throughout the whole section of the steel. And so we work both sides of it with a torch. And the two bridge maintainers have to work together to try to and get the heat through. Um, all these pictures uh, close up, I was taking, I was also the person with the heat gun, where I was checking the temperature behind the flame and letting them know what the temperature was and whether they had to speed up or slow down in order to get the temperature that we're looking for. Um, so this becomes a little bit of a, a dance, as you will, as they start off working together, and then when they get to the web, the person here has to flip up to the other side. The person on this side flips down and does the bottom of the web. So we would actually practice this without the flames 
being lit because we didn't want to burn each other or catch anything on fire. Um, and so it, it was kind of a nuanced, let's make sure we get this right and we can do this safely. Here's a up close picture of the puncture from the diaphragm coming through the web. Uh, we knew that we weren't going to do much repair here, that a section of this web was going to have to come out. And so while we're in the process of working on the heat straightening, we had to design in detail a web plate that we would fasten over this hole in order to transfer the forces through the web, as well as design in detail flange plates that we're going to add to the bottom flange. This became a little bit of a negotiation. This outline you see here is what we agreed to was going to be cutting out. Originally, I think the crew had something that was like out here. And so we had to kind of dial things back. All these spots you see here, those are spot heats. Again, that's another specific pattern to heat straightening. Uh, they're working the bulge that was caused by the diaphragm pushing through the web. And so a uh, spot heat is, used, is a one-sided heat to use to try to cause the steel to move backwards. Um, against the bulge. And you can see that we've started to kind of lay out where the plate's going to go. We've given them a detail of that plate, and so we've sketched it out on there to make sure it's going to fit and going to do what we want it to do, and it's not, they don't have any changes in the field when that plate is going to look like. Here we've got a couple things shown here. So here we've actually tried to apply some restraining force as we work to try to get that bulge out. So we had the tear from the diaphragm, and we've got a, a large piece of steel in here that we're now pulling against to put a restraining force to use with those spot heats to try to work that bulge back in to the web. And we're also working portions of the bottom flange where we have these deformations. This is a large C-clamp, obviously. Uh, it's got a 25-ton uh, jack on here, and we're working to try to get some of the deformation up from that bottom flange to make it uh, easier to attach those flange plates that we're going to be adding. Here we've gone through and bolted up the uh, web plate. We're working on the, the flange plate on here. And here's a shot of the finished work after we went through and uh, added a two coat painting system to it. Uh, you can just kind of make out the uh, web plate here. This was the shot we took the day that we were notified on February 19th. Here's a shot uh, later in the year after it was completed. We were able to get the 18-inch uh, displacement down to approximately uh, half an inch, and we're able to get the web, uh, excuse, pardon me, the bottom flange up fairly close as well. Um, you can see from the bolt pattern here, there's still a little bit of a, a whoop in there we weren't able to get. After we notified the accident, we actually started work on March 3rd. We were finished on April 10th. It was uh, 19 working days for all the work using daytime lane closures. I included three days for paint removal and nine days of actual heat straightening. Um, an actual total project cost of approximately $120,000 for that repair. A repair that we worked on this year is in Concord. This is uh, Hoyt Road over I-93. This is exit to 17. This is a five-span IBC. It was built in 1958. We have a larger vertical clearance here over the interstate of 16 foot 4. The accident occurred on March 14th. We knew about it on March 14th because the traffic was backed up and we got lots of calls about it. We had damage to girder number eight, which is in span number four, which is over I-93 southbound, and it's approximately 11 and a half inch horizontal displacement, plus the, uh, another puncture from the diaphragm. There were three vehicles involved, and there actually were injuries, although all appear to be minor. Here's the culprit. It's a dump truck with a body that, for some reason, started to go up before it passed underneath the bridge. About four miles north of here, there's another overpass that they didn't hit, so we surmise. That overhead with maybe the body partially up and not up at all. And sometime between those two overpasses, the body came up. So I'm not going to name the, the company here, but this is the same company that uh, earlier last year tried to drive a concrete truck over one of our state-maintained covered bridges and also had poor results. That told a lot of timber work. Unfortunately, we didn't have to do any heat straightening on. Here's a photo that kind of shows where the uh, impact occurred. There's three lanes of, on I-83 in this section. The right lane is a ramp lane uh, in order to take this ramp up onto uh, White Road. And then there's the two three lanes takes place in the, the left lane right in the middle. One of the things we had to consider was traffic control, when we could access this area, what we, had to, what we could do for lane closures. Uh, we had to come up with a bit of a traffic control plan presented to our front office, explain how long we thought the work was going to take, et cetera. A uh, portion of the work meant that we would be closing that ramp that I mentioned in the previous slide down. 
we did have a have to put up a sign detour when that ramp was closed to get people off the other ramp and back up around. Um, and then also the traffic volumes dictated our work hours. We went out, I believe, at 9 a.m. after the uh, morning rush hour and were able to work later in the afternoon. There's a couple shots of the, uh, the damage here. This is, uh, you can definitely see here that we've got a string line up from bearing to bearing that shows the displacement of that exterior girder. This girder is composite with the concrete deck, which was nice. So when we, every force we applied on it made it a little bit easier to predict how the beam was going to respond and move. So the crew started off by deleading. Uh, here we did the deleading using uh, the just lane closures during the regular work hours. And then doing the heat straightening. Again, you see a couple employees are working on V heats here. And now you see we have, and on the right hand side, we have a couple employees using spot heats to work on that bulge through there. And here's the hole where the diaphragm punched through. We've got the C-clamp again, so the same C-clamp, and we're trying to apply a little bit of pressure to that in order to try to get course that bolt to go back. Picture on the right-hand side, there, we had to take down a couple of bridge-mounted signs, and so the superintendent had the idea of running some uh, threaded rod through the, si through the holes that are already there for that bridge-mounted sign up to a uh, double angle that's on here in order to apply some restraint forces, some jacket force to that bulge. Um, it's difficult sometimes on a bowl to try to get any type of force on there uh, to assist you with the heat straightening. In the course of fabricating, uh, detailing and fabricating the web plate that we're going to be installing here over that hole, we detailed a filler plate. So after the crew, uh, after we kind of laid out where the cut was, the crew cut out the damaged portion of the web, we saw the filler plate between our two repair plates. Repair plates, you can see on the right-hand photo, came down, pre-drilled. We use them as a template to drill through the web and then bolt that up. And you can see a shot of the finished product. We got this within less than half an inch difference on the string line from bearing to bearing compared to what it was. So from the notice of the accident, we started work on the 26th. We finished, ended up finishing up the work May 2nd. Uh, it's 25 working days uh, for all the work using daytime closures, including four days of paint removal, 15 days of heat straightening, total project cost of approximately $70,000. Just some other notes that I had about the, uh, the heat straightening. At times, at least in New Hampshire, we tend to be a little bit conservative with the straining force. Uh, we don't do heat straining very often. It comes up about every four years. And almost every time, we end up with a different crew doing the work. And so it's kind of this relearning training process every time we go to do it. Um, the process can be slow. Uh, we try to get as many heats in as we can in a day, but there's days that we don't get a lot of movement in the girder. Um, it seems like it stops, but we find if we kind of keep at it, as the literature suggests, we may be working through some of the residual stresses from the impact. There are often punctures or tears associated with overhead damage that necess necessitates a uh, designed, detailed, and bolted web in the flange plates. It takes some time before every project to make sure we get all the materials together, particularly our uh, gases for our torches. You go through a lot of gas. Um, in the last job uh, detail here in Concord, the uh, superintendent was talking to a gas supplier. We actually ended up with a bottle of uh, liquid oxygen to use. So you end up going through a lot of oxygen. That one bottle uh, equates to about eight regular uh, oxygen bottles. Uh, a typical oxygen bottle that we're using is about 244 cubic feet of oxygen. Uh, we, uh, in addition to V heats, the crews, uh, our crews tend to use spot heats rather than uh, line heats. And as I've been talking about, we tend to have trouble with bulges trying to get those out. That's a difficult nut to crack. Just another shot of Dover. I want to thank you. I like, uh, you know, Andy and I weren't particularly thrilled to have to come up and talk in front of a big group like this, but we like coming out and talking about the work our crews do. We're, you know, very you know, proud of our bridge maintenance crews and the work they're able to accomplish, um, as these two cases indicate. Was there any questions? Uh, we've got a similar bridge where we're looking at this as well. Um, one of our concerns, though, was when you put your flange plates on the bottom and then the bolt head sticking down, you're further reducing the vertical clearance. Did you guys look at alternatives to that bottom flange plate and bolts? No, I don't think we did. <laughs> um, it, you know, we, we knew that we weren't going to be able to get the girder back to exactly th the way it was before, the way it was designed. And so you know, we knew we were going to have to de depend on putting uh, some kind of you know, stiffener on there. I think from an installation standpoint, it's kind of like the easiest thing to install from a practical standpoint. In the case of that Concord Bridge, the clearance is well over 16 feet. I mean, nobody should be hitting that. Um, in the case of Dover, that's a local road. Um, that logging unit had no business going down that road. It doesn't often see over height like that. Um, 
if we had a situation on a state, you know, uh, overpass over an interstate again, that was a lot low, closer, closer clearance, maybe we'd have to consider something else. Easy question here. Uh, did you use in-house forces or was it a contractor? This is wholly in-house forces. Good. Hence the low cost. I have a question about the Dover Bridge too. Um, does it have a hit history? Has it been hit before? Has it been hit since? Most bridges we go out to, you can see some scuff marks around. We're not, a, I'm not aware of any major hits that ever occurred on that bridge. It's the first one I'm aware of since it was constructed. We certainly haven't done any over high damage on that. There's no evidence when we're out there that any had occurred in the past. The two projects that you presented, the first one, about $120,000 total. The second one, about 70000 The second project you presented was in a higher profile location, probably more implications with traffic control requirements, and everything like that, but the cost was significantly less. Was there a learning process on the first one that might have uh, led to the higher costs? And if so, do you know kind of you know, what lent the, uh, the difference in pricing there? I think uh, a lot of our costs is tied to labor. I think we, uh, we're so we probably spent more you know, time on that job, and I think that's a direct result of the uh, our inexperience of doing it. That was in 2015. It was really the first large heat straightening job we'd done for many, many years. When Concord happened, we still had that experience. And even though it was a different bridge crew, so I had a different crew doing it, we had members from that first crew go over and help out. And so I, that, the, uh, the less work hours, and just our experience and our, our Comfort, you know, how comfortable we were doing that work, I think, led to the lower cost. What is the reason to train your crew? Because in this, these situations, most of the time, the cost is recoverable. Speed. We can get it done. We don't have contractors. I used to doing this work in New Hampshire. When we've contracted this out before, we ended up with uh, contractors from like the Midwest or the Mid-Atlantic or some, some place like that. Um, and the times in the past we've done it, We've had folks in my bureau have to provide the traffic control because they don't do their own traffic control. Uh, sometimes we provide the lifts because they don't bring their own lifts. We do the uh, paint removal because they don't do their own paint removal. So in this case, our forces are doing majority of the work. We're just not doing the straightening part. And we've seen that, and we can do that. You know. And we were able to assess and respond and actually do it, I think, far quicker than we would have been able to get a contract out to be able to do it put all the costs together, we give them to our Bureau of Finance, and unless something comes up, we assume we got it. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.